All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Math 122. Today we're going to talk uh, first about a homework problem. Uh, from the homework, which is due tonight, I've received a lot of questions about this problem. Uh, so we're going to talk it over as a class, and then we'll start our usual class. So uh, what do we have? We have a company which is producing and selling shirts, and we have fixed costs and variable costs, $6 uh, per shirt and $7,000 for our fixed costs. Uh, so we want to come up with a cost function, okay? So uh, you can already see we've got uh, my answers on here. Uh, so what are we going to do? We're just going to add our, jeez. We're going to add, to get C of Q, we're going to take our fixed cost, which is 7,000, and we're going to add to that our variable cost, which is 6, times the quantity of shirts that we make. So that's how we get the cost function. Now to get the revenue function, Revenue is just what we collect from the customer, okay? Revenue is what we collect from the customer. So if we're selling the shirts for $12 a shirt, then we're gonna get 12Q. Yeah, I think most people did not have much issue with that. But let's talk about the next part, which is to say we're now gonna bring in demand, okay? So if we have uh, a demand function, Q, which is given by uh, 2000 minus 40P, okay, then Given the current price, which is $12, we can figure out how many shirts people want to buy given that price by plugging it in for P in this equation, okay? And then, of course, if you know the quantity which are sold, you can figure out the profit by taking the profit function, which is given by pi of Q is 12Q minus, and we want to subtract 7,000 plus 6Q from that to get our profit function. So at the end of the day, we get 6Q minus 7,000. So if we know the quantity which are uh, bought by consumers, we can plug that quantity into the profit function to find out how much profit we are going to get. Okay, and now it comes the more difficult part, which is to say we want to now understand what is the cost function going to be as a function of the price. So we have this two-step system, right? We have that the price, which we set, tells us how much stuff people are going to buy. Those two things together tell us how much money we're going to make, right? So we want to go all the way from step one to step three in this sort of compositional process and explain what is the relationship between the price that I set and the cost that I have, or the revenue I have, or the profit that I have, okay? So here all we're gonna do, okay, here all we're gonna do is take our cost function, which is 7,000 plus 6Q, that's C of Q. If I wanna find out what is C of P, well, I'm just going to plug in this relationship for Q into my cost function and find that I get 7,000 plus six times 2,000, uh, minus 40p. And now I've got cost in terms of price. Now the thing that has been tripping people up a lot is the revenue one. If I want to find the revenue given the price. Because you think, well, I'm just going to put in 2,000 minus 40p for q in 12q. But what you have to remember is that that revenue function was assuming that we set the price to be $12. And now we're saying the price is just a variable P. It could be changing, okay? So we have to go back to the original formula for the revenue function. The original formula for the revenue function is that the revenue we make is gonna be equal to the price we charge times the number of units we sell, okay? And now we're going to input our 2000 minus 40P demand function in here and we'll get P times 2,000 minus 40p. Okay, and then how am I going to get pi of p, do you think? Subtract revenue minus cost. Yeah, I have a function for cost based on price, and I have a function for revenue based on price. To find the function for profit based on price, I'm going to subtract the two. Well, specifically, I'm going to take the revenue and I'm going to subtract from that our costs. 
Okay? So that's how we can do that problem. Any questions on that? All right, uh, if not, then let's go back to our usual notes here. Oh, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. D? Sure. Okay, so what do we end up with? What we end up with for the profit function is a quadratic. Negative 40p squared plus 2240p minus 19000. Your numbers might be different, right? But what kind of function is this? Is this a linear function? No, it's not a linear function. What kind of function is it? Quadratic. It's a quadratic function. What shape does a quadratic function make? If you graph it. A parabola. I'm seeing lots of u's. Except is this one going to make a u? This one's going to make a slightly different shape. Not a u, but a... Is it going to make an n? Okay, it's going to open down. Why is it going to open down? Yeah, because it's a negative number is the coefficient for the square term. So this is a parabola opening down. In order to find the maximum, you could do two things. You could use a graphing calculator like the problem says to use, or Desmos, or Wolfram Alpha, or something. Or you can just try to find the vertex, because the maximum of a, of a quadratic is always at the vertex. So the vertex, the vertex of ax squared plus bx plus c is at the point negative b over 2a comma f of negative b over 2a. So that's one way that you could do it without using a graphing utility if you wanted to. So in this case, b is 2,240, a is negative 40, and c is negative 19,000. OK, so we just plug in. And we get the vertex. Does that answer your question? All right. Any other questions on this one before we move on to today's class? OK, last call before we go to notes. Yeah? Can you just go over how you get to the quadratic of the positive, like from all the other numbers? Mm hmm. So if you multiply, if you take the cost function and multiply this out, what are you going to get? You'd get uh, what? 12,000 plus 7,000, it's like 19,000 minus 40, or minus 240p, right? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, and then if you multiply this one out, what would I get? I would get 2,000p minus. 40p squared, yeah? And if I do r of p minus c of p, I'd get 2,000p minus 40p squared. And then I would subtract from that 19,000 minus 240p. OK? And if you collect the like terms here, 2,000p and then plus 240p, <coughs> That gives us 2,240p, right? And then negative 40p squared, and then negative 19,000 gives us the profit function. Was that what you were asking about? Yeah. OK. <coughs> All right. Let's start for today then. Um, so this is where I want to be, I think. What is that? Hmm. Oh, I remember what that is. OK. So. 
let's get on the same page about this stuff. So we finished up supply and demand last time. So today we're going to talk over section 1.5. Uh, your 1.4 homework is due today at 11.59 p.m. Uh, 1.5 is coming soon. I'll probably post it tomorrow to be due on like Monday or Tuesday. Uh, your next assessment is today. It's quiz two. And it covers the homework questions from homework 1.2 and homework 1.3. Uh, so. Regarding my office hours, okay, uh, I'm going to be in the math tutoring center from 10 to 12 on Tuesdays, okay? And I will be in my office, 439 in LeConte, from Wednesday from 3 to 4. And then I will be in my office on Thursdays from 1130 to 1. Sometimes I'll go into the room next door if I have too many students. Okay, so those are the office hours. Uh, can you raise your hand if you've been to office hours so far? Okay, has it been helpful? Yes, okay. So if you come to office hours, we can literally just go through your homework, okay, and get it all done with help. It's gonna be a lot easier than trying to do it on your own. So come to office hours and we'll work on problems together, okay? All right, so that's office hours. Uh, if you can't go to office hours, though, your best bet is to go to the Math Tutoring Center. It's LeConte 102, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Thursday, 10 to 2 on Fridays. Any administrative questions before we start in on today's lesson? Okay, well, let me remind you what we talked about last time. So last time, we talked a little bit more about profit, revenue, and cost functions. And we also talked about marginal cost and marginal revenue and marginal profit. Can someone remind me what those are? And let me make this full screen. What were marginal cost, marginal revenue, and marginal profit about? Yeah, it's cost per unit or revenue per unit or profit per unit. In other words, it's the rate of change of these functions. The rate of change of a linear function can be expressed by a property of that linear function. What is that property? The rate of change of a line slope. is the slope of that line, how steep it is, right? Okay, so the marginal cost, marginal revenue, and marginal profit are the slope of the cost, revenue, and profit functions. Okay, then we had break-even quantity. Break-even means our revenue is the same as our costs, <coughs> and therefore our profit is zero. So that's break-even quantity. Then we had supply and demand. And they were a little bit weird because instead of saying that the input is going to be a quantity and the output is going to be an amount of money. Now we're saying that the input is an amount of money and the output is a quantity. And that quantity will be the amount which, for supply, it's the amount which producers want to produce based on that price. If the price is really high and the producer can make a lot of money, they want to make more of that product so that they can sell more of it so that they can make more money. On the other hand, if you're a consumer, or if you're just the consumer, the, the big capital C general invisible hand consumer, okay, then if the price is higher, the consumers want to buy less of it, right? Because it's not as worth it, okay? It's not as much of a value. So these are the supply and demand functions. The equilibrium price is the price at which the supply and the demand are the same. It's kind of like the break even quantity for revenue and cost. Okay, so that was what we talked about last time. Any questions about any of that before we move on to talk today about exponential functions?
Okay, doesn't seem like there are any questions. So let's talk about exponentials. Okay, so we're going to go through warm-up problem A together. Okay, and then we're, this is going to sort of motivate today's lesson. And uh, since we have a quiz today, let me set the alarm so I don't forget to give you the quiz. Wouldn't that be tragic? <laughs> we end at 4.05, so I pass them out at, at 3.50. So I'll set the alarm for 3.48 p.m. 42 minutes. Okay, we can do this. So, uh, exponential, this might be the most important uh, section that you learn uh, in this entire class. And it might be the most important mathematical topic that you learn in your life. Uh, because compound interest and interest in general is going to be the mechanism by which your wealth grows. Okay, I'm not saying wealth in terms of saying that you are wealthy now, but at some point you will have an amount of money and you may want to invest it and you may want to have that money grow, say, for your retirement account or something. So understanding interest is going to be vital uh, to that endeavor. So let's talk about a couple different banks. Okay, now this is sort of unrealistic because nobody uses simple interest anymore, but let's compare two banks. One bank, okay, bank A, what do we say? Uh, they will deposit an additional $10 per year into our account year after year. They always give us $10. Okay, they always give us $10. But if we put our money into bank B, what's going to happen? If we put our money into bank B, they're going to give us, at the end of each year, 10% of our current balance, right? 10% of our current balance. So 10% of 100 is 10. So for the first year, it's going to be the same, right? What am I going to have in my bank account after one year? Just $110 because they add $10 to my original 100. Then if, let's just continue with bank A. Then I'll have 120 and then I'll have 130. But how do I figure part B? What I do for part B is I actually take 100 and I multiply that times 1.1 to get 110. Okay, no problem. It's the same so far. But what happens next year? We take 110. And we multiply that times 1.1. And then what do I have? Not 120, but 121, right? Yeah, 121. And then what's going to happen? We're going to, again, multiply by 1.1. And at the end, we're going to have 133.1, right? So you can see that over time, not only is the amount of money in my account increasing, it's increasing faster and faster and faster, right? It's increasing faster and faster. From here, I went up by $10 first, and then I went up by $11, and then I went up by like $12.1, right? So the amount of money which I'm getting in interest is going up over time, okay? So this is why uh, compound interest is so important because if you earn 10% on your investment and you invest like say $50,000 in your 20s, by the time you're 65, on the last year of your investment when you have like $1 million in your account, you earn 10% on 1 million, that's $100,000, right? So the, the big earnings that you're going to get out of your compound interest are going to be in like the last couple of years of your investment period, right? So really, if you can, the best thing that you can possibly do is put aside some money now, if you can make it work, uh, to invest in your retirement at this age. You'll have to do so, 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 so much less when you are in your 40s and 50s and 60s in order to sort of save for retirement. So that's my spiel on that. But anyways, we can see we prefer compound interest, right? We prefer compound interest to simple interest. So let's see how we can actually figure out, use math to understand how much money am I going to have in the future if I invest this much in this bank at this time and leave it there for however many years, right? OK. So to do that, we're going to use exponential functions. So what is an exponential function, first of all? Well, an exponential function. We say it, it is an exponential function with base a if p of t, OK, so p is the function, t is the input, time here is measured in years. 
is equal to the product of two things. We take our initial quantity, P naught, and we multiply that with this number A raised to the power T, where T is the number of years. Okay, so for example, in the previous problem, we had P of T equals 100. That was our initial pro uh, investment times 1.1 to the power T. Okay, to the power T. That was what we had in the previous problem. Okay, so uh, in terms of what we call growth rate or decay rate, okay, this is a, a, a letter which we use the letter R for, okay, this is a variable which represents the year after year like percent growth, okay, percent growth. So this A value, okay, is going to be what we are multiplying each year, which is going to be equal to actually 1 plus R. Why 1 plus R? Because we multiply first by 1 to say that, look, we still have the amount of money which we initially invested. And then we're going to add, okay, whatever that rate is, whatever that rate is, we're going to add that times our initial investment or times our previous, uh, previous amount of money to get our new amount of money. Okay, so these are the two ways which we write them. We write P of T equals P naught times A to the T, or we write P zero uh, times one plus R to the T. Okay, so the next thing to understand is, well, when are we gonna have exponential growth as opposed to exponential decay? Okay, and for R, it's very simple. If R is a positive number, Right? If our growth rate is positive, then we're experiencing exponential growth. But if R is a positive number, what kind of number is A going to be? It's going to also be a positive number, but can we say more? If, a, if R is larger than 0 and A is given by the sum of R and 1, What's R gonna what's A gonna be? Yeah, greater than one, right? Okay, so if our A value is greater than one, we're experiencing exponential growth. Because we're multiplying year after year by a number which is bigger than one. If you multiply by a number bigger than one, your original number gets bigger. Right? What if I multiply by a number which is less than one? If I multiply successively by one half, times one half, times one half, times one half, my number is getting smaller, right? This is so this is so-called exponential decay. So that's what happens if a is less than 1. Right? And the corresponding r value, if a is less than 1 and a is given by 1 plus r, then r must be less than 0, right? Okay, so this is what governs whether we're going to have exponential growth or decay. Any questions so far? Okay, we're going to use this to model all sorts of different uh, things. We could use it to model, say, well, the, the, the major things which you use exponential growth and decay to model are money in the bank, number of uh, humans or, or some other species in a population. Okay, so population growth is exponential because more people equals more babies equals more people, right? Equals more babies. So that's population. And then also, what else do we have? What are some other things that we could model using exponential growth and decay? We got money, we got population. Anything else? So far, we've mostly been talking about exponential growth. Anything that decays exponentially? Yeah, that's the, probably the main place you've heard the word decay in a scientific context is radioactive decay, right? So radioactive isotopes decay over time. That's how we can do things like carbon dating um, to understand how old an artifact is when we dig it up out of the ground, right? So uh, 
essentially in, in radioactive decay, what's happening is you have a substance and all of the atoms of this substance are decaying at a certain rate. So the more that you have, the faster it's decaying, right? And the less that you have, the faster it's decaying. Which is why if I have a 10 kilogram sample and a one kilogram sample, it'll take the same amount of time for the 10 kilogram sample to decay to five kilograms as it will take the one kilogram sample to decay to half a kilogram, right? Because the rate of decay is proportional to the amount that we have, okay? Same deal with interest in the bank. The amount of interest we get is proportional to the amount of money that we have in the bank. Okay, so it's the same concept, but sort of in a reverse direction, right? All right, so that's exponential functions. So let's see, okay. So here's what I wanted to say about the difference between linear functions and exponential functions. So what characterizes a linear function is this constant rate of change, okay? Look, you go over one, you go up a certain amount. You go over one, you go up the same amount. You go over one, you go up the same amount. Every time you just increase by the same amount, right? So what do I get? If I go from x to x plus one, I've gone up by m, right? And again, when I move from x plus one to x plus two, I'm gonna again go up by the slope, m. So I can just take the previous height and add m to it. Or I could take the height from two back, and then what would I need to add to it? So my question is, what needs to go here? f of x plus two can be gotten, the height of this point can be gotten by taking the height of this point plus what number? Close, 2m, right? We went over twice. Each time we go over once, we go up by m. If I go over twice, I go up by 2m, right? So we could put a, we could put a 2m here, right? Okay, so we're just going up by m each time we go over by one, okay? So the, the, sort of characterizing pattern here is as we move from left to right, we're successively adding, successive addition. That's what's going on here. Or successive subtraction if you have a negative slope, right? Okay, well, the difference between a linear function and exponential functions is that instead of having a constant rate of change, we are going to have a constant relative rate of change. Now, what does that mean? What that means is instead of successive addition, we're going to encounter successive multiplication, okay? So, I start at x. I have a certain height of my function, right? If I have a certain height of my function. Well, if I move over one in terms of my x values, I'm gonna take my previous height and instead of adding something to it, I'm gonna take my previous height and multiply by a certain number. Okay, so in this case, this would be an example of where a is bigger than one and we have exponential growth. And then to do the next step, I'm gonna again take the previous height and multiply by a, which is why you're gonna see that each time the difference in height is actually gonna get larger from, for each step, right? We're gaining more and more faster and faster, which is driving this sort of curvature in our graph, right? So if I get the next thing by multiplying by A, and then again, I get the next thing by multiplying by A of the previous thing, how do I make a two-step process? How do I do a two-step process? What's gonna go in my question mark spot here? Yeah, a squared, okay? To make two steps, we multiply by a and then by a again. That's the same as multiplying by a squared, okay? So this is the difference between linear functions and exponential functions. Linear, we're adding something each time. 
exponential, we are multiplying something each time. Big, big difference. Okay. Any questions on that so far? Okay. So uh, I just want to, let's see, we're going to do a group exercise in a minute here. But I want to show you really quickly how you can tell whether a function's exponential or not by looking at the table of values, OK? So what would, how, how did we figure out whether a function was linear by looking at the table of values? Anybody remember how we did that? Yeah, yeah Andon. Kind of like a constant slope, like throughout. Exactly. We had, to, we had to recognize that there was a constant slope or constant rate of change between intervals. Okay, constant rate of change between intervals. So the way we did that was we checked, well, what was the rise over the run on each interval, right? That's what we checked. So let's check first if it's linear. So if, it's, if it was linear, we went up by four over one. The next time we went up by six and over one. I can already conclude that this is not a linear function because the rate of change for the first interval was like a slope of four and the second interval was like a slope of six. So it's definitely not a linear function. OK, so how am I going to ch check uh, whether this table represents an exponential function or not? Well, what I need to check is, look, if this is an exponential function, then I get from 14 to 18 by multiplying by a. And I get from 18 to 24 by multiplying by a. And I get from here to here by multiplying by a. Right? That's how I move, is multiplying by a. So what I want to check okay, is whether there could be such an a. Right? Whether there could be such an a. Okay. So in order to do that, I just need to think, well, what number would I need to multiply 14 by if 14 times a gives me 18, then a has to be equal to 18 over 14, right? Just by a simple division. So 18 divided by 14, we get what, like 1.28. But if this is true, and each time we're successively multiplying by a, then it should also be true that 24 times Sorry, not 24. Uh, 18 times a equals 24, right? Well, if that's true, then a should be 24 divided by 18, which let's check. 24 divided by 18. Uh-oh, I'm getting something like 1.33. OK, so. Remember, each step, we should be multiplying by the same number. We determined that to do step one, you have to multiply by 1.28. To do step two, you have to multiply by 1.33. Did I make a mistake? Are we good? OK, so from what I can see, I mean, what do we think? Is this exponential or not exponential? Okay, not exponential, because we're not multiplying by the same thing each time. We should multiply by the same number each time we move over. OK? So it's not linear and not exponential. What is it? Well, we don't know. Maybe it could be something else. OK? Any questions on that one? All right. Uh, then we're going to work on some group problems. Actually, just one group problem. We're going to work on Mildred with the hats. Okay, so in 2014, began with 25 hats, plans to increase the collection. So let's try to write an exponential formula for this process, okay? And work on it with a partner, and I'll come by and help as needed.
start with. I know what I did. I'm so confused. I added. <laughs> I wake up in the morning and believe that I'm smart. No, I'm the same way. Exactly. Um, so well, based on what photo map tells me about my equation, I got ninety one. So I think you want to Is it like P O A T? But then I twenty five times the the six years. Is it two the T? Yeah, it's two the T. Oh, that's what I wrote my equation on. Yeah, it's two the T. Yeah, it's two the T. Oh, that's what I wrote my equation on. Oh, so you can multiply it. Yeah, I was like, it's really weird. Okay. How do I draw my calculator? I was like, that's what I'm talking about. You just cannot do that. Just pull up photo map because I'm a little bit special. Oh, uh, I just are. This is weird. Oh, yeah. The uh, you can't have a third one. Yeah, what I'm going to go out this weekend, but now I feel like I have interest rate. Oh, okay. I thought you said I'm going to go out this weekend. I'm not even friends with the guy whose birthday it is, but like, I guess I'm going to You know, I'm free here. This is what I wrote in. Not really. How do I drink all my water? Well, I I definitely have to drink all my water. I said, I'm going to go to the gym yesterday. I didn't even die. Actually, not today. I mean, I wake up and I'm still. No, because I, like, you know how Tuesday comes in pain? Ours is like, 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 I hit, like, twins of pain as well. And, like, walking is so difficult. And I, like, I kind of. Um, Tuesday night, I hit R. So, like, every, everything is just in pain. Like, everything. I really like, hit, like, yesterday, but, like, not I know, I, I just. I think we're going to take a break until that. I'm just I was, like, trying to roll over in bed yesterday, and I just wanted to. I literally just did not have the muscle in my chest to, like, my friend was uh, my roommate also has, he has the black hockey jersey coming in, he ordered one. I just ordered one too, but I didn't get the cast one, I got just the like, I need one. Because like, I was like, I don't know if I, well, I don't know if I'm from Pittsburgh, so like, every time I was yeah, like, yeah, like, I was, was going to say that I like the pants. <laughs> No, I literally thought this was freaking ever. I don't even like the Steelers. Yeah, I don't know if the Steelers are also from New York. Yeah. No, I didn't like the Steelers. I'm like, not really quite Buffalo. I love the Bills. I know. Rochester is Buffalo. Yeah, that's what I heard. My two best friends are from Buffalo. Yeah, I got to go to Buffalo. Years after the Buffalo. No, like every weekend for the past two weekends, I've been doing some food and shit. I think I told you. I like my wedding on. Yeah. And then I, um, last weekend my great grandma was in the middle, so I went to the middle. Oh my god, that's actually so funny. I think, I don't know, this weekend if I feel like it might be Charleston. Well, they're trying to knock off all the major cities. Yeah, I know. When I go to Charleston, what city is it? Yeah, I know. Like right now, we're doing it. Yeah, I, I want to. Some of my friends, I want to, like, Airbnb there, and just, like, stay for, like, a weekend.
Before I take the golfing for the first time, I'm like, yeah, oh, so easy. Like, okay, wait, Would like, anyone like a little bit more time to work? My friends on the football team. Yeah. Like, I feel lots of pain in those belly floor. Okay, yeah, okay. let's talk it over. All right, so what's. Well, one thing that's a little confusing about this is the same thing that's always confusing about all of these problems is they're switching up the letters on us, aren't they? We started with P, and now they're telling us to do a function with H. So that's kind of annoying, but that's not going to throw us off, is it? Well, what's the general form of an exponential function for H going to look like? What's the general form? Well, I'm going to copy down this. It's going to look just like this, okay? So let me copy that and then put it down here. Only everywhere we see a P, I'm going to put an H instead, right? I'm going to put an H instead. OK? So H, H, H. OK. Now, what does H not represent? The initial quantity. That's the initial amount of hats, right? which we can see in the problem, she began with 25 hats. So H naught is 25. Now comes the tricky part. We increase the collection by 25% per year. So let's imagine that you were tutoring your friend, and your friend was completing this problem. And uh, they said, well, it looks like 25% is, is the thing that matters here. Uh, therefore, A is going to be 0 0.25. And we just fill out the equation H of t equals 25 times 0 0.25 uh, to the power t. Except your friend in this class made a mistake. But can you explain to the, this imaginary person what was their mistake that they made and why? Yeah, no. Uh, that's technically like they're gonna be at a loss. They're gonna be losing hats because if it's not a, like 1.25, that means they're not over like the hundred. The one means you're at 100 percent of your collection, and the two uh, two point five or the point two five yeah. is the extra percent that you're adding on. So they would be losing. Exactly. So this is a super common mistake. Okay, totally easy to make, especially the first time you see these types of things. But the way that you can ch check yourself. Right? Check yourself in your mind is look at that and think about what's going to happen when t is going up. t goes like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're successively multiplying by 1 quarter. So after a year, we're going to have 1 quarter as many hats as we started with. After two years, we're going to have 1 16th as many hats as we started with. You know, just run through these like sort of basic um, checks and you'll realize that this can't possibly be our equation because what does the problem say? She plans on increasing her hat collection, not giving them away, right? So instead, we want to make sure we include uh, our A value here. So what this is telling us actually is that, is that R is 0 0.25 and therefore A is going to be... 1 plus r, which is 1 plus 0 0.25, which is 1.25. So the correct formula should be 25 times 1.25 to the power t. OK? Any questions on that so far? OK, so the big thing with this problem is, look, you got to find the relevant pieces of this formula, right? OK. So next up, uh, your imaginary friend is, uh, is doing this same problem. 
and they say, okay, now I understand why it should be 1.25. I think I can finish this one on my own. What they want to know is how large the collection is going to be in 2020. So all I need to do is plug in 2020, which will be the year. And uh, let me just figure that out really quickly. Hang on. I don't think my calculator is going to even be able to do it. Let's check with Wolfram. Um, okay, 25 times 1.25 to the power 2020. What do we get? Okay, something times 10 to the 197. So, like, she has more hats than there are, like, atoms on the Earth. That seems like it's kind of off, right? So what was the mistake that we made? Yeah, Stephanie? Yeah, we have to remember where is our starting time and what is time measured in, okay? So a huge, hugely important thing anytime you're working with time, okay, is you got to keep in mind what are your units, i.e. am I counting seconds, days, months, years, okay? And second of all, what's my starting point? Okay, what is my starting point? So... In this case, the other part of this problem that I would highlight if I was doing an exam and I was in your class, I would highlight T years after 2014. So you can see a lot of this stuff is kind of garbage, right? You don't really need to read it, but you need to be able to extract the relevant mathematical pieces, make it into a mathematical problem, and then what do we do? We plug in our numbers, which T is going to be, if we're in 2020, it's six years since 2014. So we plug in six. And what do you get when you do that? Something like 90, what is it? 95.37. OK, am I done with the problem? No. I took the problem, translated it into math. I solved the math problem. What do I still have to do? Still have to translate it back in terms of the problem which is, in other words, answer the actual question. How large will her collection be in 2020? Yeah, 95 hats, right? Probably not, doesn't have 95.37 hats because how are you gonna buy that many hats? So probably 95 hats. And I would say at the start of 2020, maybe. <coughs> that would make sense, at the start of 2020. Because probably partway through, the T would be something like six and a half, right? And then if you plug that in, you can do a six and a half power. Yep. Quick question like that. Will you ask us to round up or round down? Well, you need to intuit that from, from the problem, right? So, I mean, usually if you're talking about... Uh, you know, if it was a question of like, yeah, it depends on the problem. So for this one, you can't really buy a part of a hat, right? So it's intuitive that we should round down. But say if there was some other question that we had, which was like, what's the minimum amount of dollars that you need to spend in order to buy something? And it's like, and the product costs like $19.99 you got to spend like a $20 bill or something like that. So that would be, a, I don't know. It's kind of hard to come up with on the spot something where you'd need to round up, but you got to think about it in terms of the problem. Sometimes it'll be a round up, sometimes it'll be a round down. Good question. Any other questions? All right, great work, everybody. Um, I'm going to move on. <laughs> yes, I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm skipping this problem because I don't want to do it. And I'm going to erase this stuff because that doesn't need to be there. Oh, yes. Okay, then we'll, maybe we'll talk about that. Okay. So let's talk about interest. Um, the, the main thing that I want to communicate to you about interest, okay, is it's basically the same. Okay, it's basically the same. 
Um, but there are some other financial instruments which banks or investment firms or loan officers will try to use to trick you. Okay, and I don't want any of you to get tricked. So I want to tell you about nominal interest rates. Okay, nominal interest rates. So you're going to see a slightly different formula. On the right hand side, we see exactly what we started with, right? Where P is going to be our amount of money after T years, and P naught is going to be our initial investment, R is the annual interest rate. But sometimes they're going to tell you. Well, we have a 5% monthly, nominal monthly interest rate. And you might be led to believe that that means I'm going to get 5% every month. But that's actually not true. You're not going to get 5% every month. You're going to get a, an amount per month which makes this roughly 5% per year. But it's actually going to be a little bit more or a little bit less, I always forget which one. So nominal interest rates are kind of tricky. So what do we have to do with nominal interest rates? Well, we say that the interest is compounded n times per year nominally, okay? Which you can think of the word nominally as meaning in name only. Okay, so what is it? Well, you're going to put in your interest rate here, you're going to divide by n, but you're also going to increase the number of times which you compound per year. Okay, So we're going to compound monthly. So let's see a quick example of how a bank could trick you. Let's say I have $100, bank A versus bank B. Bank A says 5% annual. Bank B says 5% monthly. No, 5% nominal monthly rate. It's totally easy to see how you would look at this and say, oh yeah, I get I should definitely go with bank B. I get 5% per month, right? But it's not exactly like that. So after Let's say P of T is going to be, for this one, 100 times 1.05 to the power T. Okay, simple. Bank B, on the other hand, is going to be 100 times 1 plus 0.05 over 12 to the power 12 T. Okay, big difference. Okay, let's see how it works out. So let's check what's P of 5. So five years later, see how much I'm going to have. Well, we can do 1.05 times 5, sorry, 1.05 raised to the power 5. I'm going to have something like $127.63-ish. Let's check P of 5 in this case. Well, we're going to take 0.05, divide it by 12, add it to 1, that gives us something like 1.00416666667 to the 12t. So now we're going to raise this number to the, not the fifth power, but the 60th power. Okay, and we end up with something like 128.34. Okay, so more money still, but definitely not as much money as we would get if we were actually compounding 5% monthly. Sorry? Yeah, so more money, but when we're talking about thousands of dollars, that'll be a big difference, right? So let's do bank C, which says actually 5% monthly, which is what you might think you would be getting, right? If you do 5% monthly, then you're talking 100 times 1.05 to the 60, which would be 1.05 to the power 60 times 100, 
you might think, well, at the end of five years, I'm going to be rolling in the dough. I'm going to have $1,867.92. Okay, but that's actually a lie. Well, it's not a lie. It's just sneaky. Okay? So don't let the banks be sneaky. Which one you pick is going to depend, right, on whether you're borrowing or lending which keeping your money in the bank is lending the bank your money. Okay. That's why they pay you to do it. All right. So that's nominal interest rates. Yep. Yeah. Any questions on that? Okay, how much time do I have? Two minutes. All right, we'll, we'll quickly run, run through one more example. Okay. okay, so problem four. We have $800 to invest. And the investment manager tells us that we can expect a 7% interest per year return on our investment. So let's come up with a formula for how much money we're going to have in t years. Well, we know that this should follow the annual interest rate formula, which is p of t equals p naught times 1 plus r to the t. And what is p naught going to be? 800. My initial investment is $800. How about r? R should just be 7, right? R. Right? What? Not, not just, just 7, 0.07. Yeah, 0.07, right? I was so confused <laughs> what you were saying. <laughs> like, I thought maybe you were a pirate. Um, no, yes, R should be 0 0.07, right? Okay, because it's a percent, okay? Percent means divide by 100. So 7% means 7 divided by 100, which is 0 0.07, okay? So in this case, we get P of T equals 800 times 1.07 to the power T, and that's our formula. All right, any questions on that? Yeah, Alex? This one? All right, so please put everything away except for a pencil. There's no calculators allowed. Uh, if you have a smart device, anywhere on your body, such as on your wrist,